Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sunny in Phoenix podcast, a weekly podcast where we keep you up to date on everything Phoenix Suns basketball. My name's Charlie Erling. I have Mitch Krumpetich with me, and David McGraw will be joining in for our second segment when we get around to talking about Kyrie Irving. So, Mitch, how's it going, man? It's good. Um, I'm back in the motherland of Wyoming, and I'm, I'm enjoying it here. Anything's a little better than Iowa, right? Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about the Brandon Knight injury, and then some more Kyrie Irving trade news, then maybe some non-sports plugs. We haven't hit one of those in a while, so we better. So let's get right into it. Make sure to get a hold of us on social media. Our Twitter is at Sunny and PHX Pod. Our email is Sunny and PHX Pod at gmail.com. And check us out over at our new host, the Deepish Thoughts Podcast Network, over at deepishthoughts.com. Thanks for listening to the Sunny and Phoenix Podcast. If you'd like to further support the show, you can head over to tpublic.com slash user slash Sunny and PHX. That's T E E public dot com slash user slash sunny in PHX. We've got t shirts, mugs, phone cases, all kinds of stuff. You can get our famous cheese is warming up design or just one that says sunny in PHX. Again, T public dot com slash user slash sunny in PHX. And go suns. Okay, so the news last week came out that Brandon Knight tore his ACL in his left knee and is likely to miss the entire season. This happened in a pro-am basketball game, and man, it's just tough to see a guy go down right before the season starts, and especially a guy that's in Knight's position right now, that part of his career. And another bad note is Knight also had left ankle surgery in 2015, so that left leg might be pretty rough. That might take quite a bit of rehab to get back to uh, his athleticism. Man, like the athleticism he showed this last season even, he looked great and explosive, and seeing this ACL go down, that's rough. Yeah, it is. I mean, you never want to see a guy have an injury like that, but it's just so unfortunate for Brandon Knight for multiple reasons. One, after the season he had last year this was going to be his opportunity to really bounce back now that's kind of gone and for the team there's no trade value anymore not that there was much to start with but now there's absolutely zero so it's just unfortunate for everyone involved and you know best wishes to Brandon Knight hopefully he can recover and come back but it, it, it's just so unfortunate I feel really bad for the guy yeah, and talking about trade value, it makes me wonder if there was ever any sort of offer we got for Knight during the season last year. Yeah, I mean, anything. Uh, and now seeing this, I bet we may be kicking ourselves for not shipping him off, even if it was for peanuts, but, you know. Right, well, and just for his career overall, you know, he doesn't want to be sitting on the bench not playing at all in Phoenix. I'm sure he would be happier playing a little bit more somewhere else. Exactly. So, I mean, we're, we're quite a ways out from the from training camp starting for the NBA, but the big question now is who fills in for Brandon Knight? Brandon Knight was meant to be the backup point guard and fill-in shooting guard for us last season, and now we are completely without him no matter how well he's playing or not, we're, we we do not have him now. So, who fills in? We're a little thin at the wing, and I think the one guy that we got to see plenty of at Summer League is Davon Reed, and I think he be, might be my best pick for who fills in for him. And the reason is... Yeah, I think so too. My reason behind this is just from seeing his game, what he does, uh, lets the game come to him, I think we can expect to see about what we saw out of him at Summer League. Hitting the open jumper, making the smart pass, not going too far out of his way to do anything crazy, but just kind of like the ultimate teammate. And I don't know, I just have high hopes for Reed. I do too. I mean, that was something I commented on throughout Summer League, is he, Davon Reed, was so much more NBA-ready than I expected. And that comes with his age and all of that we've 
it's beating a dead horse at this point. But um, I think that this does give him that opportunity to step into that role. And I kind of look at him as times as the anti Brandon Knight because hmm. Brandon Knight was kind of known to like force a lot of plays and those long twos that just killed all of us. Every Suns fan hated that Brandon Knight long two. And Davon Reed doesn't make those kind of plays. He doesn't try to force anything. And he, I think he understands his role very well. So um, I, I think it'll be a, a bit of a nice change of pace having him uh, fill that role. Right. And I love his size and that wingspan. That's yes. something uh, that's a little change up for us. We're used to a pretty small backcourt. And now with Booker and possibly Reed being two of our guards that are getting some big minutes, that might uh, throw just twist things up a little bit, and maybe we'll see the. I mean, I love Reed's defense. That wingspan, seven feet, seven foot wingspan on a six five six six guy. That's so, that's incredible. Yeah, it's it's awesome. All right, so Reed, I I'd say he's my number one for sure. And then things get really thin after that. We have to look at Derek Jones Jr. as our possible backup two guard when it comes to it. Uh, I know that Jones's skill set doesn't make for the uh, traditional shooting guard mold at all, <laughs> but I think uh, with with his quickness and his size and his speed and his vertical, I think he could make for a great defender and could probably give a lot of back up to some troubles and not let them score much so that might be my envisioned role for him off the bench yeah well defense is fine but we saw in summer league they ran him at that spot a little bit and it didn't go well and that was summer no. league. his shooting has a lot left to be desired still um but i mean we don't really have a ton of options at this point and just going with that defensive mindset might be the way to go right so, and then really after that, unless Tyler Eulis grows six to eight inches, <laughs> I think we're either looking for a possibly a veteran free agent to sign to maybe come in and play some spot minutes there, or we actually pre recorded the next segment, so we did bring this up. But if a trade happens with the Cavaliers and Kyrie Irving does end up coming to Phoenix, Shumpert has been tossed around as a guy that might be thrown into that trade and he's a guy I'd love to have come off the bench at the wing for us and he had a bit of a hot and cold well I mean his whole career he's had that hot and cold streak um, but he's someone that veteran presence that uh, I think the Suns could use at that spot and uh, coming off the bench he's used to that at this point so that wouldn't be an issue I don't think and uh you know, he had a bit of a down year last year, but I mean, we're we are used to bringing in guys who have had down years <laughs> into yeah. Phoenix lately, <laughs> so I, it wouldn't be anything much different for us, really. Right, and we're talking about the up and down, hot and cold play of Shumpert, and you know, with Knight, we're used to that. Right. But Shumpert plays good D. Right, and he has great hair. Great hair. <laughs> great hair. All right, let's get into this Kyrie Irving trade news. And the big thing that I took away from it was the Suns saying they will not include Dr. JJ, Josh Jackson, or Devin Booker into that trade. I think the Devin Booker idea might be a little more obvious, but I like hearing that we like Jackson that much. What do you guys think? Yeah, um, the whole Devin Booker thing was something that people like – Chris Broussard or Broussard or however you want to say it because I'm not going to I'm not going to say that dude's name right out of like principle not because I don't actually like know how to say it it's it's a principle thing for me so like between him saying that and some other nonsense ESPN people saying that is like yeah no that's that's not going to happen you guys have no idea what's going on like that Devin Booker obviously would not be in trade talks because we would be trying to get Kyrie to pair up with Devin Booker so just kind of the obvious from our front office just being like yeah no we're not trading Booker like that just ain't happening and 
Like that that's something that it's like, yeah, duh. We know that, but kind of just the reassurance from our front office is kind of nice, especially with everyone always talking crap about our front office always. Yeah, well, and then the report that came out was that the Cavs said if we would have offered Bledsoe, Jackson, and a 2018 first-round pick, they would have traded Kyrie to us already. I am glad that we're not going to trade Jackson, but it's interesting to see that's their asking price, basically. And when I see that, I see there could still be something that we could make work. That's what I think from, from that asking price. But it seems like they're pretty high on Jackson, just like we are. I think a lot of people are high on Jackson. Sorry, Chuck, but I, I just had to throw that out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree. And the thing that I'm taking away from this is, what is our offer? What are we offering them Right. as a return from the no Jackson? Is it TJ? Is it one of Chris or Bender? Could it even be Jared Dudley? Like, who who is it? We've heard heard little rumors about each each and every one of those guys, but I don't know. If I had to pick one, I'd say it'd be TJ we're trying to throw in rather than Jackson. Right. Well, even if we did TJ and someone like Dudley. Now, I'm going to reference those of you who listen to the show know that I love Zach Lowe. But Zach Lowe had Brian Windhorst on his show um, last week to talk about Kyrie and it was the most in-depth, best explanation of all the options that the Cavs have. So I highly recommend listening to that. But they brought up a great point that Jared Dudley fits exactly what LeBron wants. He wants these shooters. And Dudley would be great to play with LeBron. So why not include him? We don't really need Jared Dudley. He doesn't fit anything that we're doing except for the locker room veteran presence, this and that, which is great. And I love Jared Dudley, but if if we could somehow include him in a trade to the Cavs to get Kyrie, that'd be great. And that probably means we're taking back someone like Amon Chumper, who's on a yes, pretty bad contract. Right. So Right. But w- uh, that's I, what we have the ability to do. Yeah. As, as a team with space and looking to bring on young talent by taking on bad contracts, like we have the ability to do that. And we did that specifically to have that ability. Right. Well, and then the other thing that people talk about is Kyrie only has two years on his contract. Why do it as a rental? But the point that was brought up in that Zach Lowe podcast was that with the contracts, the way they work now, with the max being four, is it four years or five years? Um, Uh, Max with bird rights is five years normally. Okay. But most of these contracts are four years or less. So two years really isn't that short of a time when four is the max that most of these guys are getting. Except that you don't want to really, you want that full four years. I mean, like, Bledsoe, it's not really sure if we're trying to just trade him and offload him for someone young or if we're just wanting to let him play out the rest of his contract and then go get a big contract somewhere else. But, I mean... Even with the short contracts and stuff, that that's kind of not everyone, not all superstars or all stars are going for short contracts so that way they can remain flexible. I mean, most of the time, you're going to go for the monetary um, reasons and the financial aspects of I could, you know, absolutely destroy my knee. Something like maybe happened to Sean Livingston and lose all this money on the table because I wanted to do these one year outs when you're someone like Kevin Durant and LeBron who can absolutely, even if they have a catastrophic injury, they can still go get a max from someone because of just name recognition. And they could probably get a max from someone until five, six, seven years from now. Like, if they didn't play and we're just sitting and like, all right, I'm going to play. I've had this injury, but I'm good to go. Someone's going to throw him a max no matter what. Like that, that's not the same as someone like, I mean, I don't, like Steph just signed his uh, four or five year contract, whatever it was. And um, like he took the entire length of it. And the talk is that 
all I mean like most everyone else is going to take the length of those contracts. It's only the like cream of the crop, the craziest guys that are gonna be able to do these one plus one or two plus one deals and not really lose anything from it. Well, I agree with that, but all I'm saying is people need to quit viewing Kyrie having two years left on his contract as a rental just because of the length of the contracts. I don't think that's a good way to look at it. Well, I guess I just disagree because of the, like the, um, the mer- like the type of player Kyrie is where he ranks with everyone. You want those, those kind of players are always are signing four year contracts. Those players aren't signing two year contracts, I guess is what I was saying. Right. But, this is what his but either way, there's like right now. There's either going to be there's going to be two years left on this contract, no matter where he goes. Right. Either right. way. So exactly. in these two years, I think that two years might be. I know it's tough to say this with what we saw Kevin Durant do this past off season, but two years might be enough time for a guy to fall in love with the city and his teammates and want to stick around and make something better happen. I mean, imagine a backcourt. Of Kyrie and Devin Booker. That would take, man, that would take the city by storm. I think everybody could get behind Kyrie playing here in Phoenix. I think that'd be a lot of hype. And maybe that hype is something we were building up for and we were planning to take a few more years. But maybe Kyrie's the guy that bumps us up to the next notch and we turn this young team into a playoff team. So... I, I'm not worried about bringing in a guy for two years. One year is what I consider a rental. Two years, that's some time with the team. That some relationships will be built. And then maybe the guy wants to stick around if we're showing promise. So I'm not worried about that. I guess my bigger my bigger thing is that the talks of like Josh Jackson needing to be involved, where it's like, this guy's only on a two-year contract. We're not going to have him for that. And that's where kind of the two-year value kind of starts kicking in it's not as much like the do i think two years as a rental or not it's more of a mortgaging the future for two years basically it's more of what i guess i come from from that whereas i i i'm really high on josh jackson so would you consider it mortgaging the future if it were eric bledsoe and then any other player other than Josh Jackson and then that first rounder, is that mortgaging the future to you, even if it's Chris or Bender? So even if it's Chris or Bender, that is mortgaging the future. But I think that, like, I, as, I wouldn't want to trade either Chris or Bender either, but I would trade them before I would trade Josh Jackson, 100% without a second thought. What do you think, Mitch? I see you struggling there. <laughs> it's so hard to say because – like I like Josh Jackson a lot. I think he's going to be great, but he hasn't played an NBA game yet. We don't know what, you know, people say he could be Kawhi Leonard. He could also not be Kawhi Leonard. So it's just so hard to judge these guys when we haven't actually seen them play. And I do love Josh Jackson, but at the same time, from what we have seen in from Chris in a lot of games and Bender in a few select games, I just I go back and forth every day. It changes. I'm like, oh yeah, I'd rather keep Chris and Bender. And then the next day, I'm like, no, no, it's got to be Jackson. I'm just really, really struggling. I I just I know that Jackson hasn't necessarily proven anything yet, but I mean, watching him compete at a high level, watching him talk about wanting to be good like more than good he like he, the dude wants to be great and the dude's gonna leave it all out there you don't have that type of drive in every single nba player that comes into the draft you don't have that drive to be something better than just good like a lot of these guys are told they're great from forever and are okay with just getting theirs and kind of just being what they are they're not interested in playing 100 percent, 110 percent the entire time and i honestly think jackson is that guy and that trait is another thing that puts him on that level of 
this dude has the potential to be a Kawhi, be a Jimmy Butler, um, possibly in like a middling tier, be a Philly Iguodala. And he like has that potential, but he also has that drive. And I think that can't be overstated. I just really like that spicy attitude, that fiery attitude that he has. And it really fits in with what we're doing. What we saw last year, we were getting our butts kicked. And our guys were still playing hard and getting chippy when necessary. They, they weren't going to back down to anybody. And I think Jackson slides right in perfectly with that, that attitude that we're building here. And let's move on to just a, a, bit of a, a bit of a game, I guess. And it's uh, how does this impact our roster, tra- like the track of our team going forward? So we'll slide in different trade options for Kyrie here. So Bledsoe, Jackson, and that first. We'll keep Bledsoe and the first in there each time. So throw in Jackson. Is that is that a plus, a minus, or a meh? I, I honestly think that while to start out the season, TJ will probably be the starter and it'll be his job to lose. I think towards the end of the season, we would be at a negative if we traded Bledsoe and Josh Jackson for Kyrie. Minus from David. So I'm going to say plus for one reason alone. Josh Jackson has not played an NBA game. If you ask me this question a year from now, my answer might be different. And I, I got to just stay in the middle with the, the meh answer because I just think the, the trade-off, the difference between Kyrie and Bledsoe is not big enough for Jackson to make that good for us. I mean, yeah, we'd upgrade our point guard, but we'd be thin at small forward. So, exactly. Yeah. I, okay. I, I completely agree with you there, and I think that's kind of this thing – um, Kyrie is kind of the reverse Mike Conley in hype wise, whereas casual fans overrate him like no other and like hardcore fans underrate Kyrie. Whereas with Conley, you know, casual fans underrate him and hardcore fans overrate him. I, I just, I don't, Kyrie is not a superstar player and he's not going to change us into a playoff team overnight if we traded him and sent a king's ransom to the Cavs. yeah i mean i don't think he makes us a playoff team either but i think having a guy like that attracts other big name free agents and when he say if he comes to the team Kyrie and booker that backcourt would be awesome and if we keep Jackson I know we're talking about not having Jackson in this situation but those three together I think could do some amazing things and I think I I may tend to overrate Kyrie but I think what I've been seeing lately from a lot of Suns fans is him being underrated Kyrie is a great 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 player I don't know if he's a superstar or not but he is a He's probably the best finisher at the rim in the league for a guard. He's, he is an incredible player. I don't think we can forget about how good Kyrie Irving is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say that the dude isn't probably one of the best finishers in the game, if not the best. And also up there when it comes to the, han- the handles and possibly the best handles that the NBA has seen. But... I, I just, you got to remember, like, this dude couldn't win anything without LeBron. Okay, but and how, like, how many Kyrie? years ago? How many yeah, years how ago? Many years no, ago I'm, I'm, who I'm, else was on that team? I'm just saying that he has shown the ability to step up in big scenarios. But That's whenever true. LeBron has sat the last three years, the Cavs are a dumpster fire. Would any sort of, if Kyrie is the transcendent player if he's playing alongside you know if if you throw out a lineup with two three and d players tristan thompson kevin love and kyrie 
if Kyrie is that transcendent player, the Cavs should still work and be and look good without LeBron there. But whenever LeBron sits on the Cavs, they look like a dumpster fire and they're like uh, have like the plus minus is ridiculous and I know plus or minus whatever. It we have to take into a ton of context with that, but a 3 and D player in that spot, if Kyrie is a transcendent player, he should be able to make that team still work and it just doesn't. Sit Peyton Manning on any of his Colts team and let me know how the that team plays. I think that is a that, great it's, point. It's that heavily involved with LeBron. They're so used to it. LeBron takes all the reps. I kind of think of Peyton Manning and how that backup quarterback behind him in his in his glory days had no idea what was going on because he never got a snap in practice. Yeah, they yeah. also they never had a average backup quarterback because they didn't have to worry about it when it came to Peyton Manning. But the whole point is that on those Peyton Manning-led offenses, everything was designed around him making reads, making the right play. It's the same thing with the Cavs. All, that whole team is designed around LeBron. Okay, how much of an offensive system do the Cavs really have? They Are, don't really like, have one. <laughs> exactly. They don't have a system. So if your job is to go out there, hit a three, and run around a screen, then that shouldn't change whether LeBron is there or not right well i just think when you're playing with the best player in the game right now you get used to be you get used to playing with the best player in the game right, right now. and you, right. you might get a little stag- stagnant even though yeah you're competitive you're an nba player Eh, i don't know but if Kyrie is this transcendent player if he is this possible superstar player shouldn't that team still be able to run even without LeBron. That, there should still be some sort of engine there if you're doing the exact same thing, you know, like with high screener rolls or whatever, and with the main ball handler and his job is to either hit the three-point shooter or go to the rim. If That shouldn't change. That system shouldn't change, and I, I just, like, if... If Kyrie is supposed to be so good that we should trade Josh Jackson, Bledsoe, and a first for him, then I feel like without LeBron or when LeBron sits for X amount of games because he's LeBron and he can do that, then the Cavs should not have looked like the dumpster fire that they looked like. Okay, I have another analogy. In a company, a lot of times you'll have a boss who has a lot of really good trusted employees and everything runs really smoothly. But when the boss takes some time off, things don't go quite as well. (laughs) And it's not to say that all the other employees don't know what they're doing and they aren't good. They just do things a certain way and they're used to things being a certain way. The boss comes back and says, oh, you know, you missed this, you missed that, and fixes some things up and things run smoothly. It's a lot of... uh, chemistry and everyone having their own strengths that's something that we see a lot in real life and i think that can apply to this situation the team is designed for lebron it is not designed for Kyrie. that's right it is designed for an iso an isolation player to make the offense run yeah the boss yeah exactly. but <laughs> When you have a boss in real life and the boss goes away for a week, you don't just have a void where nothing is there. You have someone else in charge that more often than not is able to, they're not going to be at that good boss's level, but they will be able to step in and make sure everything runs smoothly and everything isn't a dumpster fire. And they step into a role that they're not used to, and things don't run like they usually do. Except that things still run, and they still run well enough to where everything doesn't go down the drain in that week. Whereas with LeBron, when he sits, Kyrie can't make anything run. Like, 
he can go out there and score and do whatever, but that team sucks. If a boss leaves for a week and the assistant boss is put in charge, like the whole company isn't going to like just do a nosedive because the bo- the transcendent boss left. When Richard Jefferson's working full time and the boss isn't there, I think things are fair to nosedive. I, I think agree. we need to just end it there. I think we <laughs> we feel pretty differently about it. This is running a little long for our segment here, so comment on what you think because we're not yeah. going to get anywhere. We're just going to disagree, and that's yeah, fine. We'll, we'll probably end up fighting about this as soon as we're done recording. So. <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay, now it is time for some non-sports plugs. It's been a little bit, and sadly, we're without David, so there will be no David's comic book quarter. But with Mitch, we we got Mitch's face melting minute. Let's see what he has to say. Yeah. I am really, really excited about the plugs this week because my favorite band ever, August Burns Red, released a new song called Invisible Enemy on their upcoming album Phantom Anthem that comes out on October 6th. I'm super excited about this. Um, The song has just shown a lot of growth. There's a lot of uh, tapping on the guitar in the, the lead part, which is really cool. The drumming is great. Uh, Jake's screaming just continues to improve. I'm always so impressed with that. So definitely check out the song. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely check out the song and check out the music video. It's super cool because uh, all the band members are marionette puppets and they recreate a lot of their old music videos as puppets. And for me, a fan who has seen those videos a million times and loves all of the art and stuff in the videos i thought it was really funny but just very reminiscent at the same time so definitely check that out that sounds really cool it is yeah you'll you'll have to link me that video i will post show okay (laughs) and for me i mean we haven't done this since it started but game of thrones we're two episodes in third one starts in like five hours of recording here so Sunday night I'm pretty excited so many it, things are moving really fast this season and there's a moment that I think every the Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones fan has been waiting for that is suspected to happen in this episode that I'm about to watch and I don't feel comfortable doing a spoiler I'd love to but uh yeah I, I just can't do that I can't I can't give a spoiler so I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I've just really been loving the season so far and how fast things have been moving and things are starting to wind down a little bit. We're getting near the end of the HBO series. So I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty excited. I, I look forward to Sunday night all week, which is rare. I mean, <laughs> Sunday night, but yeah, you know, you know, okay. That's enough out of me. Thanks for listening to the show. Tune in next week. We're going to be talking about something Suns related, <laughs> hopefully. We don't know yet. It's it's that part. It's that time of the year, boys. It is so. that time of year. Okay. Take it easy. Thanks for listening. Go Suns. <laughs>